And joining me now, Abdullahil Hassan, who is a professor of political science at Istanbul Shahir University. And joining us from London, Kashmiri novelist and journalist Mirza Wahid, who is the author of The Collaborator and the Book of Gold Leaves. Thank you both for joining me today. Uh, Mirza Wahid, I'll start with you there in London. This has been the deadliest year for Indian administered Kashmir. What is going on? It's been, as you said, it's been another bloody year. I'm in my mid-40s now, and the uprising, the mass movement, and the militant uprising, rebellion against Indian rule, started when I was a teenager. And since then, year after year, this is what we count. We count our dead, and uh, there's no way forward. This year has been particularly, particularly brutal. You know, I'm sure you're familiar with the word zulm. Uh, it describes everything that goes on in Kashmir. The oppression, the cruelty, the suppression, the denial of basic freedoms and basic rights, which results in a theater of war where, uh, as far as recently as Sunday, we had two teenage militants who, one of them was 14, who were killed in an encounter. Uh, at the same time, the armed forces, Indian armed forces stationed in Kashmir that keep Kashmir, that hold Kashmir for Delhi, they destroyed seven houses, residential houses, just like that, uh, which feeds into further sort of, you know, resentment and anger amongst the people. And it's not limited to militant groups. There's the, the militant groups were supported by people. Most often, uh, in recent years, we've seen large, large crowds of Kashmiris uh, flock to encounter sites where their hair so and so militant is holed up in battle with Indian security forces, Indian armed forces. And uh, these civilians, they rush to these uh, encounter sites with no, no fear of death. This is what's mm -hmm. happened in Kashmir. And I think it's primarily because India and Pakistan haven't moved uh, closer to solving it. Uh, mm -hmm. So when I was a teenager, we had this massive, massive uprising, militant uprising. And now we are looking at a second, even third generation of militants. These okay. are young boys who have seen nothing, nothing but unspeakable cruelty and oppression. And that's what drives them to take up, the, uh, to, to take up guns against Indian armed mm -hmm. forces. Okay, I want to turn to my studio guest, Abdullah I don't think Abdullah it's going Hill to end very Hassan. soon. I don't think it's going to end. Right, let me uh, ask of Abdullah Hill, is the international community doing enough to end the political dispute in Kashmir? Well, Kashmir is one of those problems that United Nations has inherited from the very beginning, along with Palestine. So these are the two issues which involve, happen to involve Muslims. They have not been able to address, it, I mean, in a proper way, and therefore, the problem continues. Mm -hmm. In the case of Kashmir, it was India, Indian diplomacy, that left the issue. I mean, Soviet Union, a number of times, cast veto. Otherwise, the problem would have been solved. Mm -hmm. This is continuing because of this kind of manipulation of the problem. Mm -hmm. And what the international community can do, they can do a lot. See, what has happened is that Pakistan was a partner from the very beginning of the dispute. Then, in 1971, Pakistan was defeated by India. And then, in 1973, there was a new pact in which India was able to force Pakistan mm -hmm. to declare the problem as a bilateral okay. issue. Because of that, it remained, I mean, out of the side of international community. Right, right. But C then, certainly there is a long yeah, history to the right. conflict, but I want to ask Mirza, do you think that the, as a journalist yourself, do you think the international media is largely ignoring the issue of Kashmir? Well, I, I wouldn't say they ignore it deliberately, but I do think that Kashmir has gone off the radar in the last few years. I mean, if you look at this year, it's been a brutal, brutal year. Over 500 people have been killed, and I'm sure not many people around the world know of it. Uh, as far, you know, uh, in last month, there's a, an 18-month-old girl, 20-month-old girl, it's a baby girl, was shot with pellets in her eyes. And I read today, or yesterday, that she may not gain vision, regain vision in one of her eyes. What happens? What, what leads to such a situation? And if then people come out in the streets facing bullets, knowing very well they're going to be killed, shot at, uh, 
well, um, even massacred in the streets or killed in their houses or their houses burned down and destroyed. This is why people are so, so fed up with Indian rule in Kashmir. 20-month-old girl, her name is Hiba Nisar. Uh, she's a baby, and I saw photographs of her with, with bandages on her eyes. I don't know what she did to deserve it. And if this, if mm -hmm. India is a democratic country, but in Kashmir it ceases to function as a democracy. It functions solely as an occupying power, whereby it uses brute force, anything within its arsenal, to suppress the militants, to suppress civilian protests, to suppress dissent. Uh, it's also become this cruel, tragic, absurd theater. You know, December 10th is a human rights day. In the heart of Srinagar, the local human rights body, the local human rights body called SHRC, State Human Rights Commission, it talked about drugs, drug abuse in the state, which is a serious issue, but did not mention the hundreds of killings this year, did not mention hundreds of kids who've been blinded, didn't talk mm -hmm. about the, what we call as disappeared people of Kashmir, about eight to 10,000 people uh, are disappeared in Kashmir. We don't know wh wh where they are. We don't know what happened to them. The Human Rights Commission in a place like Kashmir, it's headed by a you know, jobless, toothless judge, retired mm -hmm. judge, who chose to talk about drug abuse. This is where we are. Oh. This is what the Indian state has done in Kashmir. You can't even talk about Human well, rights Mirza, Mirza, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit more about that, about the, about the UNHCR um, asking for a probe into abuses in to Kashmir. Why has India continued to deny access to UN rapporteurs and international rights organizations? Uh, because India feels India is a growing economic power, uh, major Western democracies, the Americans, the British, uh, they have in the recent past signed lucrative deals with the Indian state, so they are not going to talk about human rights when it comes to India. That's why the Indian state uh, felt emboldened to dismiss it summarily. And not just the okay. Indian state, it was shocking to see senior, senior uh, co uh, commentators in India who are otherwise progressive liberal people who mm. bat for rights abusers across the country. They okay. wrote editorials dismissing okay. the first in-depth UN report into Kashmir as, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, as silly, as, as not having any merit. One of these editors, mm -hmm. who who's also happens to be uh, the chair of the Editors Guild in India, he wrote an editorial saying mm -hmm. that a report like this, which was the UNHRC, UNHRC report, is going to lead to further killings. Mm -hmm. I haven't come across a more uh, damaging or insulting, offensive uh, response to a serious, serious report into human rights abuses yeah. in Kashmir. I'm going inter to interrupt you again because I want to get some and comments that's the kind from of, my, sorry, my, my guest, can, my guest here. For, I'd like to get some comments from my guest here in the studio, Abdullah Hill. Do you agree with yeah. um, what Mirza was saying there about the economic interests with India? Do you think that the international community, the international mm -hmm. media is looking the other way because India is such a rising economic force? Yeah, there is an element in that. But you see, our colleague mentioned about his teenage experience. It started in 1988 with a new so-called Intifada. And at that time, OIC took it again. OIC, the institution that represents all Muslims. Mm -hmm. And OIC adopted a number of resolutions that they will ask India to address the issue. But India has been importing work, I mean, India is sending workers to Arab countries, yet India was never asked to follow the OIC resolutions. These are the some problems. I mean, OIC has tried, mm -hmm. if you read book, he has mentioned yeah. that OIC has a group called Kashmir uh, Concerned Issue or something like that. And it meets every year. But it is useless because OIC countries do not care about what is happening in other parts of the world. Well, what about Turkey, though? What role does Turkey play in the region in yeah. terms of political support? And what role can Turkey play? Yeah, Actually, this is a very good point. Problem with the issue is educating the people. I think this program, if you can educate people what is happening with the background information. And then my colleague has mentioned about Indian democracy. I mean, India is admired as one of the largest, the largest democracy in the world. But this is a very romantic idea. To my understanding, 
caste system and democracy do not go together. Mm -hmm. And this is what is happening. Indians do not believe that Kashmiris have right. They are human beings. Mm -hmm. And that has to be addressed. And it has to be taken to the international fora that Kashmiris are not being treated as human beings. Mm -hmm. So we have to educate people. Right. Okay, certainly. And I think Turkey can play a good mm -hmm. role in that. Certainly a very, very challenging issue that goes back many, many years. Abdullahil Hassan and Mirza Wahid, thank you both for joining me today.